Hello friends, today we are going to do the chapter Building a New State. I begin this book with my travel to Jharkhand State in the month of September 2001. My purpose on this visit was to work out a developmental program in the area of herbs, forest products and other natural resources after meeting with the Chief Minister Babu Lai Marandi, the Minister for Science and Technology, Samaresh Singh and other concerned officials. When I landed at Ranchi, a group of boys and girls greeted me with lots of flowers. I was quite moved by their regard for a simple scientist and their trust in his dreams. I recalled my earlier visit to the hill region about 75 km away from Ranchi. As I met the people of the hill region, young and old, in the village complex, sitting like them on the ground, one thing was clear to me. My presence here was ordained. The components for development were all there. A fertile area with good rainfall, tall trees and rich vegetation and people who were willing to work hard. Their faces were lit up with happiness so pure it is rarely seen anymore in the cities at least. However, their bodies look tired showing signs of excess work for a bare livelihood. On this visit, we made some headway in drawing up a viable plan for developing a herbal drugs industry in the state. Our purpose was that the drugs be manufactured within the state itself so as to provide increased income to the state from value addition and also boost industry there. This was a new experiment for the state and for us, but it offered tremendous scope. After the meeting, we started for Bokaro, the steel city. The weather was cloudy and we wondered if the flight would be cancelled, a Pavan Hans helicopter had been hired by the state government. I asked the pilot whether we could fly in this weather. All smiles. The pilot promised me a beautiful flight and so the helicopter took off with myself and two other passengers. I have often flown in a helicopter but did the weather particularly rough on this occasion. However, the pilot was skillful and I even congratulated him at one point for keeping the flight smooth in spite of the turbulence. It was a marvelous experience as we flew over vast stretches of forest and hills and streams. I wondered whether this precious nature wealth could be conserved from mindless destruction for short-term business gains. With such thoughts in my mind, I noticed that we had started descending. Suddenly, I found the two pilots in agitated discussion. I become alert myself. Looking down, I could see a large number of cars and people everywhere. Then the crash. The helicopter hit the ground with a shattering sound. Broken parts flew around us and I could see fire engine rush towards us. I simply got out of the helicopter that had hit the ground as a dead white. Fortunately, the engine failed while we were quite close to the ground. Had it failed moments earlier, we could have perished under the impact 
of the free fall. The pilots were in a state of shock and looked at me helplessly. I held their hands and thanked them. I said, sometimes it happens with flying machines and as pilots they have to face it with courage. I had to address the Chinmaya with the other students and they would all be waiting. So we rushed to the school, leaving behind the crash and the shock. The school's principal, Krishna Swami, received me and the students showered rose petals as I walked to the dais through the auditorium. News of the crash had preceded my arrival. The children sat in pin drop silence. To ease the tension, I told the young gathering, friends, when I was traveling from Ranchi to Hill, I admired God's great gift to the state. Under the ground and above it, you have minerals in abundance. The rich soil of the Jharkhand plains can give bountiful crops. When I was flying over the lonely forests and the valleys and hills, the thought of the wealth they hold in terms of forest and herbal products was very reassuring. On the ground, I saw a fully operational steel plant. Now what I see in front of me and what the new state is famous for is its industrious people. So, this state has all the wealth needed. It is a land waiting for a transformation to occur. I see in the future villages that will be provided with urban facilities and which are self-contained in respect of education, health and occupation. Today's incident will help define my remaining life's mission. I forgot my inconvenience during the landing after seeing the state's wealth. How can you use this core competence to become a developed state? For that, you have to work in the mission mode. At the time, these children would be entering adult life and taking up careers. They could be part of a national endeavor to becoming a knowledge society. Their contribution to the state itself could be tremendous. That should be their goal to make Jharkhand great. One thing that came to my mind constantly as I went around the exhibition put up by the children and watched their performances, including a marvelous peacock dance, was how important it was to improve the education system so that it did not stifle these powerhouses of creativity. I felt this is one area I must work upon with the state and the center. I continued with my other engagements after the function at the Chinmaya Vidyalaya. There was a meeting due at the town hall and I went there brushing aside the concern of the doctors thoughtfully sent by general manager of the Bokaro steel plant to look after my well-being. At the town hall, the subject I had to speak was Jharkhand's core competence and industries. I kept my speech short, preferring to let a discussion develop. Meanwhile, the electronic media had done its job. As there was a strong media presence to cover our arrival, News of the crash traveled quickly throughout the country. I started receiving calls on my mobile phone to find out whether I was alright. I did not want to disturb the meeting and gave the mobile phone 
to Dr. Vijaya Araghavan, who by then had reached by road from Ranchi. I asked him to call my elder brother in Rameshwaram, who is 86 years old, and tell him I was fine. As I was giving my talk, Dr. Vijara Ghavan passed a note to me. Your brother is not convinced that you are okay. If you are okay, he has to hear your voice. An elder brother remains elder all your life. I interrupted my speech to reassure my brother. To come back to the discussion at the town hall meeting, I was asked a very relevant question from the audience. Dr. Kalam, the questioner said, Could you please tell me why is raw material exported from many ports specially designed for this purpose? This was especially relevant to Jharkhand with its huge storehouse of mineral wealth. In answer, I narrated a conversation I had in Goa with Dr. Jose Paul, chairman of the Mormugao Port Trust. We started discussing iron ore exports to Japan, much of which take place from Panjim. He told me 30 million tons of iron ore is exported annually from the four ports. Of this, 17 million tons is exported from Mormugao alone. The ore is sold at rather a low price. A few dollars a ton as according to the buyers it is of inferior quality as such its sale did not contribute anything much to the economy the same ore utilized here would of course generate for far more income because of value addition what is value addition and could you give an example? I was asked and a powerful example came to my mind when we were working on the satellite launch vehicles in the 1970s a requirement arose for beryllium diaphragms. These are used in gyros sensors used to determine the altitude attitude the position of an aircraft in relation to specified directions of the rockets or missiles when they are in flight as they were not available locally. A procurement team was formed to purchase them in the international market. We struck a deal with the company in New York for a hundred beryllium diaphragms. Three months later, we got a message from the company that since beryllium diaphragms are used to make gyros mounted on intercontinental ballistic missiles, they did not have permission from the State Department to supply them to India. We immediately initiated action to redress the problem in our typical firefighting manner. Meanwhile, it emerged that India has one of the largest deposits of beryllium ore. The ore was exported in those days to Japan, who processed the ore into beryllium roads and sheets and exported them to U.S. companies to transform them into beryllium products such as diaphragms. I received the shock of my life. This was material mined in India and exported to Japan, who processed it and exported it to the U.S. and the U.S. company refused to give it to India. Where was our sense of initiative? What had happened to our aims? The issue figured 
prominently in the press and export of beryllium ore was stopped. The same story is repeated in other areas. The upshot is that India is poor as a nation in spite of its enormous wealth because it does not focus on value addition be it in mineral or biodiversity products or even grain or fish. In the case of beryllium ore value addition by at least 100 times is achieved during product conversion and this is worth we would be paying Japan or the US for something that originated from India itself. It is the same with iron ore and many other exports. Only the scale of value addition varies. It is a lesson that must be quickly learned. At the same meeting, another interesting question came up. Do you think in politics purity is possible? It was a little outside my purview, but there was one aspect to it raised earlier, which I would like to mention. This aspect is that an entire generation of people representing excellence in all fields, politics, industry, sciences, the arts, emerged in the years leading to independence. Mahatma Gandhi, C. V. Raman, J. R. D. Tata, Pairoj Shah B, Godrej, Lakshmanaro, Kirloskar, Ramakrishna Bajaj, Rabindranath Tagore, Dr. S. Radha Krishna, Madan Mohan Malwai. It is a long list. Suddenly, there was excellence in every sphere of society and the circumstance making such flowering possible was the vision that the nation had set for itself. I believe if the nation forms a second vision today, leaders of a stature to suit our ambition will appear once again in all walks of life including politics. The next day, I travelled to Bokaro Steel Plant, the largest steel plant in India. The general manager of the plant, Mr. Tiwari, accompanied me. The scale of the plant was breathtaking. I saw hundreds of men working in an organized way as the sweat poured off their bodies, while the molten steel flowed from the furnace like a river on fire. The iron ore would be available for years, I was told. Impressive as the plant was, I was disappointed to see that there were no industrial estates around it. Utilizing the steel produced here to make various products, I was told that Setting up of industrial estates came under the state purview. It brought back my old regret at our compartmentalized thinking. Why this fragmented governance where one agency is alentated from another? On the flight back to Delhi, I wondered how Jharkhand could best be helped. The state and the center would need to make an integrated effort. Would it possible? Written by Dr. APG Abdul Kalam. Thank you friends. Bye bye.